Silicon Valley is the capital of innovation, entrepreneurship, and risk taking. What is the role and contribution of the government to flourish Silicon Valley? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I don't want to speak for policy for the state of California, but uh, speaking from my old days at, at the Little Hoover Commission, it was is is to have uh, you know a fair and transparent legal system, a fair and transparent tax system, uh, and to protect the quality of life so that people uh, who who live here are comfortable here, uh, and to to um, to minimize. Uh, uncertainty and to, um, uh, in terms of the of the state doing things that are unexpected, to to be predictable and open in in the way we conduct our business, so they to to reduce their level of uncertainty. You no, know, I may think of my little different perspective because, um, you know, I mean, there there is a fire line, a firewall to some degree between public and private and because of the different sort of mission sets. But there also is this tremendous need, and this is how I think that we support places like Silicon Valley and innovation, and that is building sort of these relationships, public-private relationships. For example, in my organization, we have embedded um, organizations like uh, Google and Cisco and others that have uh, we want to leverage what we can't in state government to our best advantage to provide the best customer service that we can. In our case, let's talk about situational awareness or um, uh, uh, utilizing technology to get a better sense of what's happening, sort of artificial intelligence, if you would, to be able to pull information or track resources. Some of, some of that capability we may not have, but our private sector partners do. And so what we do is we want to offer and build relationships uh, so that we are finding that common set of opportunities to be able to uh, move forward. That doesn't mean that we're giving anybody a business advantage or not, but we're getting everybody to start thinking, both on government and in the private side, that there are sets of common commonalities that are in their best interest and our best interest to be able to, to uh, address issues. And that we do that in a lot of different variety of areas. In our case, we do it in, in emergency management. We do it in cybersecurity. Uh, we do it in our intelligence network uh, team. There's a lot of areas that we have taken that capability and, and, and built in. And I think with all the different agencies that are up here represented, we all do it. Uh, but it's, it, 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 you have to figure out how, how best to move forward. The Silicon Valley individual companies wish that they were the, the number one and get the contract. Sure they do, but, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about building those, those uh, understanding and, and relationships that can help each other move forward. I guess I'll ask, add one example is that, um, again, in, a lot of times private industry can look at there's opportunities to do something kind of related to us because sometimes we are challenging. And so I know in the tax world, a lot of times, um, the companies that provide all that data that knows everything about everybody and everything, a lot of times they would come to us because they would want they would have some theory and they would go, hey, can we work with you guys to figure out if some theory that we have works kind of with your data? And a lot of times we're dealing with very confidential data, especially in the tax area. And so a lot of times there's kind of barriers of how much you can share and do things, but we did a lot of partnerships with them that helped them kind of expand what they could offer to others, but we also benefit from it too because a lot of times we were a customer of theirs um, because we were needing that kind of service anyway. So sometimes there's opportunities to actually be partners with each other because a lot of the things we're doing are challenging and the things that they can help develop with us give them something that they can actually make on a larger scale that can actually be a benefit to others as well. I'll just add the last thought that you know, there are many partnerships that we have going on right now with technology. And the one that is nearest, dearest to us that we spend a lot of time with is the autonomous vehicle. The Department of Motor Vehicles has taken the lead role with the autonomous vehicle, but the California Highway Patrol 
has been embedded to teach these cars, this automation, on how to drive, the right way to drive. Not the way we traditionally drive, but the way you <laughs> should be driving. And, it, and it's very important to be able to teach this, we'll call it a computer, this computerized system on how to maneuver a vehicle through heavy traffic and really what to do in situations that are not always apparent to a lot of people. And so as we have those partnerships, the end product at the very end of the day will be a shared responsibility between state government and the private entrepreneurs who are trying to develop that product. So you'll see a lot of that in state government going on right now. Okay, next innovator that's going to. Uh, the uh, iPhone has changed the world on the social, political, economic ways and um, make this agnostic. This, are there ways that the smartphone uh, can be used both internally and externally by the state to improve our service? I'll, I'm going to start it, and I am certainly not the uh, uh, appropriate person really to talk about technology from that standpoint. I could tell you that at least today, the state is embracing that technology, because I can remember a few years back when we tried to buy the iPhone, and we couldn't. Remember that? We couldn't buy it, and uh, we, we had uh, uh, different devices out there, and state government prohibited you from, from buying those devices because at the time it was deemed to be uh, a novelty versus something technology we had to have. But I can tell you for, for us and our organization is it is a vital link for us to the external world that most of the products that we see on the horizon that we are going to be able to do uh, will be based on the technology of the iPhone. That, that we see a day at some point that every employee within the organization will have that technology at their disposal because we have ways that we can take accident reports, citations, any type of reports that we have to do and at the very push of the button, eliminate the need for paper, deliver it straight to the court, actually deliver it to you as the end user who needs the report that we have to have. And so that technology is out there, and we have to embrace it. And, uh, and I think that is the product of the, of the future. Yeah, you know, um, I think, you know, again, it's really, you know, iPhone, not to say one iPhone on Android, you know, smart tablet capabilities, Absolutely, I think are in the are, are coming uh, in, in into into view better. Uh, organizations are getting a better sense on how to use them. Uh, in in our world, you know, we oversee public all public safety communications in the state statewide. Um, there's an initiative that we're working, for example, where like I have all all the 911 centers in the state. And we're moving to next gen 911 and being able to use smartphones to be able to communicate with 911 centers, texting the 911, video to 911. But that does not come without risk. Okay? If a dispatcher is listening to a crime take place and sending information to the officers responding, is different than the dispatcher actually watching it take place and the impacts that have on the dispatcher and the and the ability to process what they're seeing and putting it into uh, a, di a dispatch out to the officers. So uh, the other thing is we have something called FirstNet. It's an initiative that's going on nationwide to build a broadbanding capability for public safety communications all on these smartphone devices. So your smartphone uh, eventually will be sort of the, the place you're going to get. If you're in public safety, you're going to be getting data, maps, uh, a photo will pop up, maybe a, if on, a, on a criminal run, you can be able to see that on your phone at the immediate time. In emergencies, you'll be able to get other kinds of data. Um, uh, that's actually happening, and um, that will become the new norm. We are putting in, in California, an earthquake early warning system. The earthquake early warning will give you a warning in advance of the shaking actually happening. Think about that for a second. You can do a lot of different things to protect yourself, but businesses and our infrastructure could actually respond positively to, to buy down any risk that the, the, a major earthquake could have to their, to their manufacturing lines, to power, water, other infrastructure. That you'll all get that on your smartphone. So the, the answer is we have just begun, I think, to really understand that, and, and, and the commissioner is right. I mean, I remember when 
We didn't have, I, mean, I remember I had a little pager to get a page, pull off the side of the road, put my coins in the phone, called the headquarters, <laughs> and, and, and check, yes, I got a page. You know, it's an I-1-1, one, one. what is it? Uh, what do you want for lunch? No. Yeah. That, that was a, uh, but the, the point is, is that we have come so far, and, and, and in the future, it, it is all that. Our comm centers, our command centers, our day-to-day -day engineers going out, doing assessments, being able to automate that information. A lot to do. It's very exciting, I think. Yeah. Um, I think that we just have to face, again, like kind of the change that are happening, the Kodak example. Everyone uses this device that I've got in my pocket, you know, more to connect to the internet and to do things than their computer now. This is really have substituted that. And so in all aspects, I think we have to look at, again, how can we, whether it's a customer internally, externally, how can we utilize these devices to make transactions easier, simpler, more efficient, more safe? How can we do those things with them? And I think government's actually done quite a bit. You know, as we, you know, we originally built websites, and then everyone, you know, they didn't translate over to mobile devices. But we all now build websites with mobile capability as well. And so I think it's continuing to look at, like, again, thinking of focusing on the customer. What do they want to do? That's the device they're going to use. We can say, oh, go, go to the library and get your computer, you know, or go home and get your computer. They go, no, I want to do it right now with this that's in my hand. And so I think, again, as we think about those customers, it's always like, how can we make those transactions easier? How can we get away from paper, signatures, things like that? How can we still do things, which brings some risk? We're always good at identifying the risks. We're typically good at group talking ourselves out of doing anything because <laughs> we thought of all the risks. Yeah. But it's really kind of embracing some of these things and looking at, you know, if we don't do it, we just become irrelevant or we just frustrate everybody, right? And we all go back to get in line at DMV, you know, like we <laughs> talked about earlier. So I think we have no choice. It's a disruption. But in government, we kind of do have a choice. We can just be a, you know, a resistor. And I think we'd have to find ways to embrace and use that. And I think that the other thing for us that's a challenge is just having the technological capabilities or bandwidth within an organization. Everyone wants more technology, but you only have a, you know, a certain size IT shop. And so they go like, we can work on these first five, but like these last five, we don't have the capacity. So I think as we talk about risk and kind of benefits is like, how do we really have the right governance internally to make sure we're doing the most efficient, effective things that are really giving us the biggest benefit, instead of we're just kind of getting in the squeaky wheel, you know, what they want. So I think that's a challenge for us, too, is a lot of times capacity to adapt to some of the new technology. So I think the recent uh, stats showed that 40% uh, of the hits, um, and I think it's probably gone up since we did the thing, 40% of the hits on state government websites were from mobile devices. Um, Secretary Batcher in May held a a session for um, department directors and their comms people to start thinking about what that would mean. How could they turn their websites, instead of a website, into a digital service? And that requires looking at what you have on your website and saying, does this benefit the, the user or does it is it a billboard for the kinds of you know programs we're having? And 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 uh, so the the whole thing was centered around user-centered design and how to go from user-centered design to uh, digital service. And we've, we've, we had uh, examples from, from Oakland, but we had also examples from state government. Uh, the Department of Social Services is being uh, really thoughtful on how they're doing this. They're moving as fast as they can with, with the care that they're taking in it. It does cam come down to, well, do you need 50, do you need a 50 page application to sign up for uh, CalFresh, you know, how, and how would you do that on a phone? Well, you can't. So you, it's how to rethink uh, your processes to jam them down into something that could be used on a smartphone that gives you all the information that the department needs for the program, and you can go back to them. You've, you've established a relationship there. You can go back and get more information, but also thinking about what the user needs and where they're going to get it. It turns out that a, a very high percentage of the people that we serve have smartphones. So that's that's something we need to start thinking in terms of our design from the very beginning. One quick thing, our Cal IPGCA training program that we flip the switch on tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., 
um, is, um, according to our provider, totally accessible to you through your iPhone and through your iPad, not just at your desktops. So um, have we deployed it in the program? No, but um, um, we're, that's where I say we're innovating uh, innovation, and you will be the first. So that's looking at mobily deploying uh, government training through your iPhone. So, and you will be the people at the front of the line trying this out. Uh, we had, I'll get back to you. Um, so I'd like to ask how you think your, what, what can your organizations do or what are your organizations doing to incorporate more women in your organizations as agents of change? And um, I mean that not just in the sense of ensuring that you're promoting women into those leadership roles, um, both at the mid-manager level, but also in your executive teams, but also just promoting um, and ensuring that there is a shift in your organizational culture that, that allows your, both your organization and women themselves to see themselves as agents of change. I guess I'll start because I was holding the mic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I my experience has been in government um, over the years is that really we've kind of done a really good job of having a more of a mix. When I first started in state, there was a lot more men than women, but now there's actually a really broadband. I've had a number of women bosses, you know, so I don't think there's really in my experience, that kind of a glass ceiling within the government organization. I know we always talk about the difference between kind of, you know, the sexes and kind of how we think, and women can use both sides of their brain at once, but men can only use one or something, you know. Um, so I think we see value in all of that. I've just, I guess in my mind, it's looking at everyone as an individual and just trying to embrace what they bring to that. And I see less and less maybe what was institutional bias or um, just kind of happen chance of what used to be before. Um, so I, in my own bias, I mean, I just don't see that we have a challenge with that. But I do see that as change happens, it doesn't happen overnight. You don't like strip everybody out and replace them with a new group. And so in some areas, you can see there's, there's less change that has occurred and in other areas where there's more. But um, I really think in state government, we do a, a Pretty good job, and again, I know we're not perfect, but really kind of making everybody an individual, not a man or a woman or a, a this or that, but that's just kind of from my perspective. Um, and I'm a man, so I don't know if that's a valid perspective. So. <laughs> um, so the the important thing is is the signals, and I mean, raw numbers is, is, is the very basis, but the important thing is is signals and um, in, in the executive levels and in the CEA levels, we're seeing um, parity. We have in the CEA ranks, we have uh, virtually an even split. Um, what we're, we're focusing on in our, our civil service improvement uh, initiatives is, is developing uh, a culture of embracing cognitive um, diversity. So to, to when you have discussions, particularly in hiring, um, to, to make sure that the hiring panel and the interview panel have people from all different backgrounds of different genders so that you, you build a culture of awareness and inclusion so that you, you bring up these ideas. We're working right now with um, McKinsey and Company. They are giving us their time to talk about how to look at uh, unconscious bias and to, to look at strategies for, for weaving, weeding that out. Um, an issue that, that we are, um, that is tougher, uh, and we, we report it every year, um, but we're still not satisfied, is there is a gender pay gap at the state of California that's about 20%, and it's, it's concentrated in uh, pay grades where women uh, make less than $70,000, and so we're working um, on a project to figure out w why why that is and, and what's happening exactly with the, uh, the um, upward mobility program. I don't know if you all are familiar with that, but when I asked about IDPs, it had to do with my experience in, in very low, low numbers of IDPs in some of these pay classifications. And so we're, we're uh, starting a research project on that and we've hired somebody to do fo some focus groups to help us work through those issues and, and I can assure you the secretary is extremely serious about this. 
We're going to our one last question now. Hello. Um, my question is actually fairly simple in theory. Um, so this whole group and get together is about change. Well, what have you guys done, or what have you gentlemen done within your group to help facilitate bringing change to it from a perspective of how do people within your agencies propose change? Uh, the agency I work for has been a challenge when I've tried to bring that stuff up. I've been told point blank by supervisors, that's not the way we do it. We've done it this way always. We're not going to change in those words. And so how have you worked to help bring those ideas up through the food chain to where they can make a difference? So, uh, again, I'm holding the mic. <laughs> uh, again, I, I think I've kind of restate what I said before, but I think it's kind of trying to shift the culture. And again, that doesn't happen overnight. It's relentless. You have to be very intentional about it because my experience, and I think if you look at like um, the data on change management in general, the biggest resistance is the people in the middle. And, it's, I, and I don't know if that's because they have the most to lose maybe with change or they've just been around longer so they're more comfortable with the way things are. Um, and so thinking of your organization, it's like how do you get that from the top to the bottom? Because at the top, people like ideas. You know, someone has a great idea. Oh, my gosh, let's do that. That's really fun. And then as it filters down, you know, the people like, oh, my God, we don't want to do that. That's crazy, you know. I think you find more willingness at the staff level and more willingness at the top and it's kind of that middle and your ex your example is exactly kind of that barrier that person there and that's really where we need to focus i think the other thing too is a lot of times in government like you guys are all doing this this um, training program and what's happening is you're having like this really great experience you're getting exposed to new ideas and you run back to the office really excited Right? Hey, I got this great idea. And they go, oh, yeah, slow down, kid. You know, we're going to keep doing what we did. So I think as a challenge for us is it's, again, changing the organization across it. And so I know at Department of General Services, what we're talking about is how do we kind of train all of our supervisors almost simultaneously on some similar concepts? So if we're talking about how do we really manage change effectively, we can't just say, well, let's hope that we give some change classes and everyone goes to them, or some people do. But if you have people who have gotten exposed and people who haven't, you're going to constantly be having these kind of conflicts because some people aren't even aware that the things they're doing maybe are biased inappropriately or they don't see the advantage of doing those. So I think, again, it's a challenge for us to say, no, it's important to invest in ourselves, our team, of, so that, and if change is really what the new normal is, then we got to get really good at it. And we got to make sure everyone has a piece in it, not just the people at the bottom, not creating a suggestion box like we used to, you know, and the suggestions pop up to the top, they go, woo, it's a great idea. And then as soon as you filter it down, it kind of dies somewhere, you know, a quiet death. Um, so I think, again, it really goes back to changing our organizations, but changing our organizations together at the same time. And that is a challenge and something that, again, I think we don't always invest in, but we're really looking at how to kind of do a training band where we do all of, like, the middle managers at once. And then kind of what are those layers that we should go through so that they all kind of have those experiences and bring them back to their workplace. And there's not like you, the oddball out who has the good ideas, and no one else wants to embrace those because they didn't kind of get exposed to those new concepts or ideas. Any other? Uh, well, uh, let me just say, look, this is not an easy issue because, and you know, I've been working at it for the last, you know, well, since I've been at, at OES. Um, but, you know, we're, the old saying, you know, you know, in, in California sort of, and any institution kind of represents 100 years of tradition unimpeded by progress, right? So, um, <laughs> What, what we have done, to answer your question specifically, is w w we have built this, this employee-driven idea team that, that it's not just, hey, you know, the director's got an idea, and let's, let's or uh, as we said, the suggestion box, got, those just didn't work. This is something where employees are invested and supported. Uh, we, we, we counter that by doing em annual employee surveys, which, which, which are measuring tools against the idea 
Ambassador Corps and what's happening within the organization. And you have to be um, uh, understanding and, and open and relevant enough to understand what's happening for your customer base. You know, in our world, if we are slow to need, slow to respond, much like in commissioner's world, unfortunately, people can die. It's not like an administrative where, you know, okay, so we didn't get to this, and so we're not going to... Well, in the public safety world, we, we got to move. And so that means that we have to be nimble and we have to understand and, and all the organization needs to do that. But that doesn't mean that we don't have challenges in, 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 in the things that were just said where you've got people who are like, look, it's, it's a hassle for me to go and make a change like that or change paperwork or change training. But look, it's the only way that we can stay relevant in today's very, very rapidly changing world. So I would just tell you, bottom up, performance uh, 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 surveys to, to bounce off, and then an executive uh, uh, oversight that and involvement that actually is, it, it is a one team, one fight. Everybody is on the same page with regards to moving forward. I know we're out of time. I'll do this in one minute. Change the world from where you sit today. Just do the best you can within that arena and things will move. And our organization, what we've asked to do, we have incorporated into every promotional exam, every training session, it's in our vision statement, it's in our strategic plan, that you are the changers, the innovators of the world. We do not accept mediocrity anymore and we are not keepers of the status quo. We put that right into our strategic plan and we want people to be innovative. We want them to think outside the box and move things forward. If you're mid-level managers and you're stymied by whatever the, the system is, change the world and where you work, and people will notice it as things go on, I, I'll tell you. But change is difficult. It's, change, it's hard for your superiors. It's hard for your CEO sometimes to really understand that. But I think that we are in prime time to be able to do the changes that we have to do to continue to deliver the best product that we can. And I'd love to talk to you about women in law enforcement first responders. We're not doing a good job. There's a lot of work that has to be done, and I'll share some ideas with you. But your question is very valid, it's appropriate, and it's contemporary, and we need to fix that. Becca, can I say a few words just about my experience of change really quick, too? So just to, to piggyback a little bit um, on what this panel says about, about change and to the gentleman's question, I want to speak a little bit about my own experience from a non-executive level. I'd come back and take in uh, the lean training that Kathleen Webb uh, back there sponsors and uh, change and impact within my organization kind of go hand in hand. And to what Commissioner Farrow said, I made a very small proposal for a change to my, my deputy. Let me go and let me lean some processes. And if I fail, I'll fail fast, but I'll fail smart because I've got some training behind me. And if it doesn't work, it's not really going to impact too many people. So no one's really going to know about it. Let me just give this a shot. I did it. It was a, a huge success. And so I do encourage that lean training because it is proven not just within state government, but just around the world. And from that, my deputy has given, um, has the confidence in investing in me to be able to make more incremental changes. And so today, I actually now am helping at the department level with some strategic planning efforts. So I'd say, you know, take that idea, start small, like this panel's talking about, have your, uh, your folks um, build some confidence around the things because you're proving what you can do, and then just take that energy and move forward, and you'll really see um, some difference. And, and this training program will help with that as well. So thank you.